the four by 100 relay final in the 1996 Olympic Games. They get away without Ghana. America starting well, but so too of Canada. Canada going really well. Esby with a very good first leg and a very good change to Gilbert. The bobsleigh brakeman, but also going well for America is Tim Hart. No question, Carl Lewis running. On the third leg for America, Mike Marsh. For Canada, Surin. And Surin is clear. Canada lead. America in second place. Brazil out third. And Canada win it. America second. And it looks like Brazil in third place. 37. 0.69 outside the world record, but the Canadians have done exactly what they promised to do. The team that won the world championship in Gothenburg last year has won again. Esme on the first, Gilbert on the second, Surrey on the third, Betty on the fourth. The changes were good, they remained together. The pressure never got to them and the Americans who expected so much have to settle for second place. And still, the inquest will go on. No Leroy Burrell is injured. Carl Lewis, a spectator. Good this. Time to enjoy it. Time to celebrate it. His second gold medal. So this morning we're talking about the state of student ministry. Um, you're probably wondering what in the world a uh, video about the 96 Summer Olympics and men wearing very short shorts and tight clothes and sprinting has anything to do with student ministry. Uh, for your sake and mine, I'm not even going to pretend to try to find a connection between those two because there probably isn't one. But we did want to show you that this morning because I think it says a lot about the state of our student ministry and it speaks a lot about the state of our church and what scripture calls our life as a race. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning. Um, so I'm really excited to, uh, to have the privilege uh, for us to be able to talk to you guys about student ministry. A lot of you have students in kids ministry. A lot of you know about student ministry. A lot of you don't know about student ministry, though. You show up here on Sunday morning. You have no idea what happens on Wednesday night in that room and in that room behind me. Um, and it's incredible. And so we want to talk a little bit about that this morning. But uh, in order to talk about the state of student ministry, we have to talk about it in a way that we all understand it. And so when I say student ministry, you probably have a thought that comes to your head about how you feel about student ministry. Whether you had a good experience, a bad experience, whether you like student ministry, whether you don't, if we don't first kind of deconstruct what student ministry is and what it isn't, then we'll never be able to understand fully when we start talking about the state of student ministry. And so Steve and I sat this week and came up with, this is, this is what we believe student ministry in America is all about, but more importantly and specifically, what student ministry in, in our context here at Osage Hills is about. And it's this, student ministry is about raising up a generation of believers by passing the baton of spiritual formation and relationship to the mature Christian, sorry, from the mature Christian to the young Christian. Do you see the connection now between that video? The passing of the spiritual baton. The baton is spiritual formation, just like runners pass a physical baton as they run. Throughout scripture, this book that we call the Bible is riddled about how our life looks like a race. And the crazy thing is, there's all kinds of races. There's long distance. There's sprints. And then there are the races that shouldn't be run by people like me, and we should just sit on the sidelines because we're not helping anybody. But our lives look like a race. And the crazy thing about a race, and the reason we wanted to show that video, specifically the relay race, is the relay race involves more than one person, and it's an entire team, and the outcome of that race is affected by that entire team. In 96, at the Olympic Games, America was poised to win gold. Well, you just saw they didn't win gold. They, they took home silver because Canada outraced them and out perfectly handed off the baton 
America's biggest mess up was they screwed up the third and fourth baton handoff. And here's my fear. My fear is that we have a church in America that is missing the handoff of spiritual formation to our youth and to our kids. To the very people sitting in this room this morning, it's no coincidence that on family worship day that we're doing this conversation while your kids sit next to you, around you, on your lap. In this room, if you are not an adult over the age of, let's say, 20, the next generation is sitting in this room. How we handle the baton handoff of spiritual formation is going to directly affect the success or failure of that generation spiritually. We don't get to take home gold because we did our job and someone else didn't do their job. If we miss that baton handoff, then everyone's going home with silver. If Stephen and I do the baton handoff well, and someone else behind us or after us misses that handoff, guess what? We don't get to walk home with the gold. We still get silver. The outcome of the race is affected by how the entire team does. You in this room are called to run a race, to run a race for the next generation. And my fear is both what I've seen with my eyes here and what I've heard from other pastors all across the country is that as a church, not Osage Hills, but as the American church, we are missing the mark on handing off that baton of spiritual formation. And we're paying the price for it. So I think there's a common misconception about the purpose and the role of student ministries in a church and the purpose and the role of the student pastors who lead and shepherd those ministries. There's a common misunderstanding of what our job and our role is. Um, without stepping on toes, but being completely honest, I and Stephen have both heard with our own ears, well, you're just a glorified babysitter. All you do is drink Mountain Dew and play video games. Like, what do you do the rest of the week? The average student pastor works 80 hours a week and gets paid for about 20 of those. When it comes to church budgets, the student pastors is, or the student ministries is usually the smallest, the least attended, the least funded, and has the least leaders. Steve and I are a part of a, a, a youth, uh, youth pastors Facebook group called uh, Youthmen, Everyday Youth Pastors. And there's just over, I think last night we crossed over 10,000 members in that group. Um, and in that group every day, we get to interact with other youth pastors across the country and even the globe. And what their struggle is in student ministry or what their successes are in student ministry, what their failures are. And there seems to be this common thread that we see over and over and over and over again. The lack of involvement in, in our specific ministry, whether that be by parents or parental figures, whether that be with leaders or the financial investment and involvement, that there is a lack of those things when it comes to student ministry. We can sit here all day and talk about why those things are the way they are. That's not what we're here to do. What we want to do this morning is Stephen and I talked about wanting you to leave this room feeling empowered, challenged, and encouraged to help us as your student pastors help spiritually form the next generation. I'm not a runner. I'll be the first to tell you I will write a check. I'll do whatever I can to get out of running. I will do anything to not run. If I take more than 10 steps, I will start wheezing. I will. That's, I am not. This body was not built athletically. It just wasn't. I don't know why. I've asked. It wasn't. It's okay. But we're all called to run a race. And the crazy thing is, is when we think about that race, our races look different. For me personally, as a youth pastor, my biggest struggle is I like to compare my race to other people's races. I like to look at Stephen's ministry and go, why does he have more students and more leaders? I like to look at other churches and go, why do they have that much money in their budget? Why does that youth pastor teach the way they do? I wish I could be like that youth pastor. And the crazy thing is God has not called me to run that church's or that student ministry's race. 
God's called me to run the race that he's set out and predestined before me while I'm here at Osage Hills. It's my job to run my race. It's your job to run your race. And as we're running our race and we're keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, we're not worried about everything else around us. That's what our students worry about. The culture and the context of student ministry in the world today is our students have no identity because they're trying to figure out who they are based on what the world says about them. If you're a woman and you aren't a size zero and you don't wear these name brand clothes and you don't look like this, then you'll never be loved by a man and you'll never amount to anything. That's what our girls are hearing. Men, if you're not the starting quarterback, the starting best basketball player, you don't, uh, you're not sumo cum laude or what, uh, that wasn't me, obviously. If you're not the smartest, you'll never amount to anything. You will never bring anything to the table. You're worthless. That's what our students hear every day, five days a week. And that's just at school. The sad reality is Steve was going to talk about some of the dynamics about our student ministry and the families here in our church is unfortunately, they're hearing that at home too. No one's passing the baton of spiritual formation off. As we sat down and we talked about this, one of the, one of the things we kind of came to both is, is men who grew up in the church and in youth groups and now being leaders and in charge of youth groups. That's a scary thought. We begin to think about, we've heard these scripture verses about our life being like a race being talked about before. And we began to look at those and talk about them, and we realized that we came up to the same conclusion that we believe that if we did that analogy, that most of the time the student's name and face is the baton. Then we talk about that handoff of spiritual formation. When we say that, what we think about is we're handing a kid off from mom and dad to children's pastor and children's ministry, and then from children's pastor and children's ministry to youth ministry, and from youth ministry to, for our context, high school ministry, and high school ministry to college, and college to young adult, and young adult into the church fold. And what we realized is that's not biblical at all. In fact, that's so far wrong about the way that we should view the ministries within our church. We shouldn't shovel kids from place to place. They're, they're doing plenty of that now. Kids are so busy we lose numbers left and right because they're so incredibly busy. They have hours of homework, then they have hours of extracurricular activities, and then they have hours of other things because they're trying to get ready to go to college or go to trade school or to go into the workforce because someone is telling them that these things is how you define success. This is how you live your life. If you want to be successful, if you want to matter, you have to do these things. They're so busy. They're being shuffled from one place to the next. They have so many things vying for their attention. And the reality is, is that where they're looking, where they're getting formed spiritually is in the darkest, most wrong places possible. Scripture is riddled, obviously, in this book about how our life looks like a race. It's, uh, it's all, all throughout. In 2 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, Hebrews... Acts, Galatians, Ephesians, basically the entire New Testament. But in Hebrews specifically, and this is where I kind of want to rest this morning, Hebrews 12 says this, and I think this is perfect for the context in which we live in, here at Lake of the Ozarks at Osage Hills, but also as a community and as a country. This is the state of churches and youth pastors all over. Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we also have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, there are people watching every step, every move that we make. Let us lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. We are pastors. We are not perfect. We're the farthest thing from. But let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The world is watching what the church does, how the church handles themselves. What is the church doing in the way that we raise our kids, in the way that we interact with the culture and the context? The world is watching our every move. They watch when we get cut off on the highway. What do we do? What do we not do? What do we not throw up? Or what do we not say at the window? How we interact 
in the line at the grocery store when someone does us wrong? How do we handle ourselves? You know who else is watching? Your kids, the students in our culture. They're watching every move we make, everything that we say, and we are spiritually forming some good, some bad. Church, we have the opportunity, and more than the opportunity, we have the command to spiritually form the students that God has blessed us with. I don't care if you sit in this room and you're a mom or a dad, or you have no kids. Maybe you're a grandparent or not a grandparent. Maybe you'd identify that you have wealth. Maybe you would identify that you don't have wealth. It doesn't matter what your status is sitting in this room. You are sitting in this room and you call yourself the church. We are the church. And therefore, as the church, it is our job to spiritually form the next generation to the best of our ability. It's a command that God gives us. But unfortunately, I think within that command, in the best intentions and in the worst, we flubbed that spiritual formation handoff. I've heard with my own ears, not from anyone in this room, of course, that it is my job or Stephen's job or the student ministry's job to spiritually form the youth in our, in our area. While that is true, I don't think that's an accurate representation of our jobs. Let me put it this way. In this, uh, in this container is 168 uh, ping pong balls. I have counted every one of them. I was very nervous about doing this visual because I'm terrible at math. It was my worst subject. So if I can't add or subtract, I'm a student pastor, not a mathematician. Work with me here. 168 balls in this container. What each one of these represent is one hour of our student's life for one week. So for this morning, uh, take a journey with me that this is Billy, and this is his entire week, and somehow Billy is both a middle schooler and a high schooler, because it makes sense, I know. Billy has 168 hours to spend his week. He doesn't get any more time than that. He doesn't get any less time. He has exactly 168 hours every week that he's given. Two hours is the amount of time that Billy spends on our campus on a Wednesday night. For my context, from 6.30 to 8.30, for Stephen, from 7 to 9. In two hours, we have to take this book and all the truths and all the facts and all the hard things that are in this book and contextualize them in a way that a middle or a high schooler would understand in this short of time. Oh, by the way, in these two hours, we do worship, we do large group teaching, we do small group, we do games, and we feed our students. So somehow we have to do all of that and compress this into those two hours. Not a lot of time. This jar is 13 hours. This is the amount of time that the average student spends in extracurricular activities. Athletics, academics, band, choir, acting, robotics, whatever it is, this is the average amount of time that the student will spend in extracurricular activities. Some of you in this room are laughing because you think that this is the amount of time your kids sleep in a week and that this is more accurate to you, you know, shuffling around from sports to robotics to the next thing. This is, we're working on percentages here, people. This is the average. 13 hours is what they will spend in extracurricular activities around teachers and administrators, around their peers. 13 hours. This, uh, this large uh, thing, vase, yes, thank you, vase. Um, I feel very eloquent right now. Uh, this vase right here, <laughs> I can't even say that without laughing. This is 36, 36 hours that the average student will spend in school. And all the kids went, Ugh. yes, you have to go to school for 36 hours a week. And in 36 hours around teachers and administrators, around principals and peers, your son, your daughter, your neighbor, your grandson or granddaughter is being formed spiritually in the 36 hours that they are outside of your control inside the context of a school. 36. It's how long that they will spend in a classroom school setting. Um, 
this large jar is what's left over. And according to uh, statistics and averages, 119 hours. Well, yes, a lot of that's spent in sleep during a week. 119 hours is what's left over to spend time with family, with parents, with grandparents, with parental-like figures in their life. That's this container. If we were to, just based on sheer number of hours, rate first to last of importance, guess where student ministry falls? Dead last. Guess what trumps student ministry? Everything else. 119 hours, parents, grandparents, neighbors, people sitting in this room that know a middle school or high school student. Your job, according to scripture, is to help spiritually form the next generation. You have the greatest impact. You have the greatest impact. Not me as their youth pastor, not Stephen. You have the greatest impact on their life spiritually. Next, the Christian principals and teachers and educators and administrators that are riddled throughout our school systems at the lake area that find every way possible to not break laws and rules, but stand up for their beliefs and their faiths in the face of adversaries, in the face of ups and downs, 36 hours that these people spend with your kids. And our hope and prayer is that they get one of those teachers that are spiritually forming them the best they can within those 36 hours. We hope the same thing when they're in extracurricular activities, that that coach, that that principal, that teacher, that peer, that sponsor that they're around on trips and on bus rides for weekends on end and practices on end and games on end is helping, uh, is helping form them spiritually. And then last but certainly not least, the two little hours that are left over, we want to form your kids spiritually. It's our job that's our duty, but it's not solely our job or our duty to form your kids in the two hours that we have. It's not possible. But imagine that if we took our two hours and we added it to the 13 hours and we partnered with schools and extracurricular activities and we partnered with administrators and principals to help them in the best way that we can, maybe it's to coach, maybe it's to care for teachers and take them goodie baskets, and then we partner with you as parents and grandparents Imagine the difference we could make. Imagine what the church would look like. Imagine what the next generation would look like if all of these things partnered together. Stephen's going to talk about what that looks like in the context of our church here at Osage Hills. Didn't John do a great job? Does he look good this morning? <laughs> well, like John said, um, it feels like an uphill battle, um, especially when we have parents who aren't passing the baton well. And we have a community that isn't passing the baton well of spiritual formation of the gospel. Uh, it feels like what Jaron and I are doing is a, is a major uphill battle. Um, but the Lord is certainly using our student ministry in a mighty way here uh, at the Lake of the Ozarks. It's very unique. Student ministry here, is what I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes, is very unique to the, um, to the different cultures and, and places that I've done student ministry. I've been in youth ministry almost 10 years now. And uh, I worked at a small country church in Madison, Missouri for, uh, for, for several years. And then I took a job as a family pastor in St. Louis. And uh, Laura and I were, were married when we were in, in St. Louis. And, um, and I would like, when I think about my student ministry when I was in St. Louis, I think about uh, that it, it was more of an average student ministry. When I think of what youth ministry is like across the nation, um, it felt like pretty much a run-of-the-mill student ministry program. Uh, we had about 40 students, 6th through 12th grade, one, one group pulled together, 6th through 12th graders, and, uh, and we were comprised of the 40, about 35 of them were church kids. Grandma and grandpa went to church and brought them along with them. They grew up in the uh, children's ministry program. Uh, mom and dad, or, or one of them, 
brought them to church on Sunday mornings and said, hey, you need to get to youth group. And they kicked them our way on Wednesday nights. And they were either by obligation there or by their own desire, they came to our student ministry. They had some semblance of understanding of what student ministry is and what, what their call is as students, as young people in their role as a Christian. Uh, they, had, um, they had an idea of who God was, of who Jesus is and what that should mean for their life. And we, we simply discipled them and built on that foundation that they already had because they've been in church since they were young. So when Lauren and I moved here to the lake in August of 2014, we quickly realized that student culture and student ministry here at the lake was going to be immensely different, immensely different, which is maybe surprising considering where St. Louis is and the culture that they have there. Uh, about two weeks into our time here, we invited a group of 10 junior and senior guys over to our house. We heard that these were the guys that were at all the events. These are the ones that were kind of the core group. They were upperclassmen, and I was hoping that they might be our leaders for that next, e next two years in the student ministry. So we invited them over to our house to get to know us. Uh, they'd actually already reached out to us through uh, Facebook to meet us and to get to know us. And, and, uh, and so we invited them over. We had some pizza, of course. And uh, we played some soccer, and we, we uh, did a board game, watched a movie, and just spent the, the afternoon and the evening with them. And very quickly, we realized the, the broken homes um, and how horrifically broken they were that nine of these ten boys were coming from. Nine out of the ten were coming from homes where, where dad was in jail for, for selling drugs, where mom uh, had OD'd where mom and dad were both in jail, and so grandma's raising. Where, where grandma's raising another one because dad, he went to jail for money laundering and mom had passed away. Where dad wasn't in the picture because he had been abusing, both physically and sexually abusing. And they were in our living room trying to find some sense of normalcy, looking to Lauren and I to feed them a family meal asking us questions, sharing about their dreams and their future, what they're excited about, what they desired. And they left that night, and Laura and I sat on the couch, and we wondered, how on earth is God going to use the two of us to be mom and dad and teacher and mentor and tutor and coach and cheerleader and shepherd? If this is nine out of the ten of every student that we have, that's... That's 90 high schoolers that God is asking us to do that with. And it was scary. It was saddening. It was different. It was unique. Student ministry here at the lake is very unique. And, and, uh, and the, the staff, the elders, Pastor Ken, they've all been very, um, very helpful in allowing John and I to format our student ministry in order to meet what we believe are the most essential needs of, of the youth culture here at the lake. Uh, so we've been able to explore that. And, and I feel like there are three things that we do here at, at Oak Hills in our student ministry that make us unique, but also have been uh, a cause for success in our student ministry. And really, factors that have gone to making us the largest student ministry uh, within a 75-mile radius of the lake. And I don't say that to be boastful, and, and these numbers I'm going to throw at you are not for us to be arrogant, but simply that we can rejoice in, together in what the Lord is doing here at Osage Hills uh, and give him the glory for what he's doing in our community that so desperately needs the gospel. Uh, the first thing I want to mention is that Jaron and I, we have a split format. Jaron is the middle school pastor. I am the high school pastor. That means when a middle schooler shows up on Wednesday nights, they go and they meet with Jaron and his middle school leaders who, and, and all their topics of discussion and their sermons, their events, their formatting on Wednesday nights, their, their um, retreats, their camps, everything is focused towards middle school issues, middle school topics. Because the very truth of the matter is what an 11 and 12-year-old girl is dealing with is very different than what an 18 and 19-year-old girl could be dealing with or boy. And how that is two very different uh, schools. We're, we're the only student minister here at the lake that has a split format. And, and we believe that you could shotgun a message, shotgun shell it, and maybe hit a huge audience of, of teenagers. But we feel like we have the ability, and you all have allowed us to have the ability to have two student ministries here. Where we can minister to, to uh, children in different, different ways that they need to hear specifically. Uh, and they, they appreciate that in all sorts of ways. It's, it's, a, it's a fact of safety 
to be quite frank with you. Um, an 11 year, 12 year old girl does not need to be in the same room with an 18 and 19 year old boy who has a um, home arrest anklet on, house arrest anklet. And we see those types of students in our high school ministry all the time. We, we allow them to cater, and we cater to their desire for a tribe-like mentality. That's really uh, what, what youth culture is like. They want to be a part of a tribe. They want to be part of people who like the same things as them, that, that have the same interests, that have the same struggles. And so allowing a middle schooler to walk into a room of middle schoolers and not into a room of high schoolers, they feel like they're part of a family, like they're part of a culture that is theirs, that they can have ownership in. It's their tribe. And, and so our student ministries, both middle school and high school, have flourished under that split format. Uh, we've seen a lot of great growth from that very thing. Usually, uh, a student ministry will be uh, represented by about 10% of the church congregation. So if a church is 200 people. The youth group's usually about 20 people. And uh, we've been blessed, and the Lord has blessed uh, our youth group to be about double the size of the national average for student ministries, which is such an awesome thing that God is doing. A second thing that I think makes student ministry at O Hills unique is our focus. There's really two schools of focus in student ministry, discipleship focused and missions focused. Discipleship, you're building upon a foundation that's already been set. You're, you're allowing um, uh, adults and mentors to come in and show them what's, what's deeper in a relationship with the Lord. Uh, we tend to be more missions focused at O Hills. Uh, uh, several weeks ago, I met with a, a pastor here from the lake, and uh, he was looking for some advice on, on what they could do to help their student ministry to flourish. It was, it's kind of been in decline. They knew that O'Hills had a, had, a, had a solid program. They're like, so what are you doing? What's, what's working? I asked him, uh, you know, in comparison, students that attend Sunday morning services versus students that attend Wednesday night services. And they said, well, we have 25 to 30 that attend on a on a Sunday morning, and we have about 25 to 30 that attend on a Wednesday night. And he asked that same question back, and I said, well, on Sunday morning, if you look around, uh, we have a small number that attend Sunday morning. Do we have any high schoolers in the room this morning? Oh, well, there we go. A couple over here. Awesome. In the back. Love you, Winton. Good man back there. Um, but on Wednesday nights, on a full night, we'll have somewhere between 120 to 130 middle school and high school students. And he was totally flabbergasted by that. He couldn't believe that number. What are you doing that's, that's bringing those types of students in? Well, everything that John and I do, from the, the topics and the messages that we teach to the way we format our Wednesday night meetings, the events that we plan, the retreats that we do, the trips that we take, everything is to introduce a student to Jesus for the first time. Because here at the lake, parents are not passing the baton to their children. And so we have children in our student ministries who have zero foundation of Jesus Christ. But here's the interesting thing. They're coming because they want a community. They're looking to be a part of something. They know that there's something greater than themselves that exists out there, and they desire to experience it and to know, is that God that I, that I think is out there? And so we get to introduce students to Jesus all the time. John and I ran some numbers, and, uh, and praise God that in the last four years, we've, we've been able to baptize about 50 students into the kingdom of God. And we are just so blessed that God has been able to use uh, the mission focus of the student ministry to, to truly grow the kingdom of God and to pass that baton. Finally, I think something that is a true strength, and it takes me back to Lauren and I sitting on our couch thinking, how on earth are we going to do this alone? Well, God never intended for us to try to do that alone. He has given us and blessed us with passionate adult leaders who care for teenagers. They exist. They're actually real. The that care We're about middle schoolers, the, the unicorns of, this, of the ministry world, adults who care about middle school and high school students, right? And we have, uh, we've had a, a core group that have led uh, weekly through the school year on Wednesday nights. Uh, we lead a small group of 10, 11, 12 um, students that care for them. They love them. They pass on wisdom that, that God has revealed to them as adults. They've prepared them and simply been a mentor or a father or mother figure to them that they don't have anywhere else. And we've seen about 40 adults in the last year from our church in some capacity, shape, or form serve alongside us in student ministry. 
from being cooks on Wednesday night, feeding them. It might not seem like a big deal, a big deal. but it is a big deal because the first off, they're amazing cooks. It's delicious food. Um, but because for a lot of these students, it is the only time in the entire week that they're getting a family-style meal where they're walking into adults who care about them, who are cooking for them, making them dinner, and then sitting and asking about how their day was. It's their only time in the week. Some of them aren't eating dinner because of the type of financial situations that they're coming from, and it's their only meal outside of school that they're getting in the evening. And so it's a great gift that we have in adults that are cooking for our students. We have adults who own boats and take our students out on the lake. We do lake days at the end of the summer where we have 50, 60 students piling onto wakeboarding boats and Different pontoons. Boats, not, not the same boat. Not the same boat, not no. Same we boat. don't want to break dang, any. That's dangerous. We're not breaking any laws or anything. Anyway, well, maybe it's not that, not that I know of anyways. <laughs> but, um, we, um, so we, and they might, this might not seem like a big deal. Many of our high school students, they're seniors, and they've grown up here. They were born at Lake Regional, and they've never been on a boat before. They've never experienced that before. And so when we have adults who are saying, hey, let me show you how to strap on this wakeboard. It goes like this. You just lean, and you, they teach them how to wakeboard. The amount of trust and relationship and being able to join in that adventure with them is invaluable. We have adults that do that. We have adults that financially support our students to go to the trips that we do, the retreats and the, the camps that we take during the, um, the winter and, and summer months. And above all, we have adults who care for them weekly, weekly care. Maybe you feel like that's not you. That's not the season of life. We, I mean, you wouldn't believe the different types of leaders that we have in our student ministries uh, from different walks of life. Where's Ron Kozier? I think he's in here. Where's Ronald Kozier? Ronald Kozier. He is in his 70s. He is a uh, retired metallurgical professor from Rolla, and God gave him a group of 10 freshman football players. It seems kind of like crazy, right? But through Ron's Twinkies and the sodas that he brought, brings them on Wednesday Delicious. nights, he won them over. And then over the past several years, he's been able to plant seeds of truth, of love, of grace, of the kingdom of God in these young men's hearts that we only know what God can cause the growth in those lives. Uh, Steve and Heather Durbin, they were here during first service. They can't come on Wednesday nights. They have four very young children. Uh, they both work uh, but what they do is on Tuesdays, they have felt the call to open up their home, open up their family, open up their refrigerator to a group of 10 students who want to go deeper into their walk with God. And so they don't necessarily feel equipped to lead a Bible study, but they facilitate a, a Bible study through Right Now Media, what we offer to all of you through our website, a, a huge database and resource of video Bible studies. And they do that uh, three weeks on, one week off through most of the school year. These, these men and women are equipping the next generation. And this isn't a new concept that we're just coming up with, that, that, um, that mature Christians should be raising up young Christians. It's actually right from Scripture. Ephesians 4, and I'll kind of um, just kind of summarize this real quick. Ephesians 4, 11 says that God gave pastors, he gave uh, apostles, he gave teachers, he gave uh, missionaries. And I would go further and say he gave mothers and fathers and aunts and uncles, and grandparents, and coaches, and tutors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry that God has prepared for them to do. Paul knew that if the church was going to survive, if it could thrive, it needed to be done by mature men and women who were willing to pass the baton to young men and women. And if it wouldn't happen, if it didn't happen, then our church buildings would become museums of what God used to do. And that would literally die off with the old. And Paul knew this. And Paul knew what would happen to the young people if we didn't do this. It goes further in, in uh, verse 14 in the scripture and says that, uh, that if this doesn't happen, that they will be tossed by the wind and the waves of deceitful teachings of men. That's my paraphrase. If they'd be tossed by the wind and waves. This millennial generation is in need and it's struggling uh, because we aren't passing the baton well. And I just said a word that probably sent a shiver up your spine, millennial. Mm. Ooh, gross. Millennials, right? They get a pretty bad rep. Millennials, they are entitled. Mm. They are tatted and then pierced up. Mm -hmm. They think they know everything. Mm -hmm. Gross. Avocado toast? Yes, I don't know what that has to do, but I agree. No, no. How many of you are, uh, are baby boomers out here? 
Baby boomers in the room. Got some baby boomers. Generation X. There are Gen Xers out there. All right. So millennials have the opinion that if you're a baby boomer or a Gen Xer, then you think that they're worthless. The news is saying it. Social media is covered with it. You guys are destroying our culture. We had a really good thing going, but you millennials, you've ruined it. You've destroyed our country. You're destroying our culture. Well, let me, let me ask you to think about things differently for a second, if that's you. Um, I don't think that seven, eight, nine, ten year old children are the creators of culture. I simply think that our children, millennials, are byproducts and advocates of the culture in which they're born into. When baby boomer grandparents didn't pass that baton of the truth to their Generation X children, and then in turn, when those Gen X parents didn't pass the baton of truth to their children, what do we expect is going to happen? When we don't follow through with our children properly, with the, with the youth of our culture, things are going to deteriorate, and they're going to be tossed like the wind and the waves. This reminds me of a story. In fact, uh, who, who remembers what happened? Uh, Christmas Day, we're going way back, 14 years ago. Christmas Day, 2004. What happened in the news? You guys remember? Something catastrophic. Do you remember? What is it? That's right. You hear that? Tsunami. Way to go. Tsunami, right? The, the giant 8.7 earthquake that took place um, in the Indian Ocean ravaged the coast of Asia and, and Africa, hit Madagascar, hit Sri Lanka and India. 200,000 people died from those waves. And I remember sitting there. I was in high school in 2004. I'm sorry. I was in high school in 2004. And I remember sitting there and watching the newsreel play over and over and over and over and over again. I just wanted to watch the parades over and over and over again. And they had eyewitness footage. And there's one footage reel that they played so much and forever it's, it's just scarred into my brain. It's a little boy. He's maybe, maybe 10, 11 years old, and he's standing alone on a beach. You can hear people screaming in the background. You can hear sirens going off in the distance. You can hear the thunderous roar of waves rolling, and the camera pans from this little boy standing on the beach to the ocean. And there in the ocean, 50 or 60-foot waves are just raging into the shore, maybe 150 yards off. And he's there by himself scared to death, doesn't know to run. He doesn't know that the sirens mean that he needed to run. He didn't see the warning signs. He's just standing there watching the pretty waves roll in. Everyone's screaming, everyone's run. And then in an instant, those waves hit him. And he just, in a blink of an eye, was gone. Washed away. And at high school, I remember watching that and thinking to myself, where was his mother? Where was his father? Why didn't they scoop him up in their arms and take him to safe, solid, higher ground? Where were they? Why didn't they at least teach him that when the sirens and when the red flags are going off, when the waves are rolling in, that you need to run? Okay, maybe mom and dad weren't there. What about the other hundreds of adults that were standing on that beach at one point? Why didn't one of them save them? Why didn't one of them help this poor, helpless child who stood there? Why didn't they just run and scoop him up? They were only a little ways away. We like to blame the millennials for the culture that they live in. When blaming them for the culture we have now is like blaming that boy for the waves. We know better, adults, parents, grandparents, teachers, neighbors. We know better. And God has given us a chance, a baton of truth, of gospel, that we can hand off, that we can save, that we can equip the next generation. Because if their parents aren't going to save them, then who will? It's us. It's the church. Who's going to save that little girl, that eighth grade girl at school of the Osage who's overweight, who cuts herself? 
because she feels like nothing. Who's going to save her? Who's going to save the, the junior boy at Camdenton High School? Who, who if he runs a 440, 40-yard dash, but mom and dad need him to run a 439 because they need a free ticket to college, and he's only as good as his, how fast his legs can take him. He feels like he's worthless. Who's going to help him? Who's going to save him? Who's going to save the seventh grade boy and the seventh grade girl who were in a car and they decided they're going to do something they shouldn't do because no one taught them how to live properly, how to love properly, how to, how to be a man and woman of God. Who's going to save them? We're here now at a place where we're drawn on iron. Ask, we're not asking you to take 10 high school boys paintballing every weekend. That's not what we're asking you to do. We have a place. For, that is you. We have a place for you. But we're asking you to consider how God might be leading you to equip the next generation for the work of ministry that God has asked you to do that we might rise up a new generation of believers as a church. What is God asking you to do about it? How can we let them sit on that beach waiting for the waves to roll in? How can we do that? Something that's important to us in student ministry is uh, on Wednesday nights, after the message, we break up into small groups. We have uh, adult leaders who sit with, with students, and they pray together, and they encourage one another. They talk about the message. They talk about the message. And what we'd like to ask you to do, either with your family, if you have young ones with you, or maybe with the people sitting behind you or in front of you or around you, we're going to break up into some little small groups right now. And we're going to pray uh, together. So why don't you go ahead and find some people around you. Be friendly. Just go ahead and, and circle up into groups okay, of it might four. Be a little awkward. Yeah. It's totally fine. Go ahead and, and, uh, and we're going to pray together. So why don't you go ahead and find, find each other real quick.